from verse 1, and it came to pass as he was in a certain place praying, when he sees one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, even as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when ye pray, say, Father, thy name be hallowed, thy kingdom come, give us our needed bread for each day, and remit us our sins. For we also remit to everyone indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Verse 9, And I say to you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Verse 14, And he was casting out a demon, and it was done. And it came to pass, the demon being gone out, the dumb man spoke, and the crowd wandered. But some from among them said, By the Elzebub, the prince of the demons, cast he out demons. And others, tempting him, sought from him a sign out of heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house set against a house falls. And if also Satan is divided against himself, how shall his kingdom subsist? Because he say that I cast out demons by the Beelzebub. But if I by the Beelzebub cast out demons, your sons by whom do they cast them out? For this reason they shall be your judges. But if I, but if by the finger of God I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God is come upon you. When the strong man armed keeps his own house, his goods are in peace. But when the stronger than he coming upon him overcomes him, he takes away his canopy in which he trusted, and he will divide the spoil he has taken from him. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of the man, he goes to his right place seeking rest and not finding any. He says, I will return to my house whence I came out. And having come, he finds it swept in the dawn. Then he goes and takes seven other spirits worse than himself, and entering in, they dwell there. And the last condition of that man becomes worse than the first. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman, lifting up her voice out of the crowd, said to him, Blessed is the womb that has borne thee, and the past which thou hast touched him. But he said, Ye rather, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. That's why the reading of the scriptures. You'll notice when you go through this whole chapter that the Lord Jesus addresses many different uh, kind of people. The disciples at the beginning, and then uh, his opponents after they had reacted to this uh, great miracle. And then this woman who said, blessed is the womb, and so on. And then the crowd, uh, we will see that the next time Lord willing, coming back to that other question that they had asked about the sign of he out of heaven. And so, and at the end of the chapter, you see he uh, addresses the Pharisee. So the Lord speaks to many different people in this chapter. But I would like to make the connection with what we had before. You remember, the Lord Jesus is on the way out. Where would he go out? At Jerusalem. The very religious center that was set up in Judaism, once given by God, now it rejected, or is going to reject, the own Messiah. And so the Lord Jesus needed to go out right there. It would culminate, the opposition would culminate there, as we see in the course of this book. And so now he is on a journey from Galilee, where he had most of his early ministry, he was on a journey to Jerusalem. And these chapters, from the end of chapter 9, in chapter 18, describe different events in connection with this journey. The Lord came in, that's the first part of this book, now he was on the way out. And we have seen in chapter 9 that this going out was really connected with his suffering. It was his exodus through death and burial and resurrection he would go out. And then we have seen uh, the last time that on this journey there are many lessons to be learned and there was this question about eternal life at the end of chapter 10, and then how the Lord applied this to this man, and spoke about the Samaritan, and then we have seen how he was received into the house of the woman, Martha, and 
was there with her sister Mary, and so we saw many lessons there at the end of chapter 10. And what I would like to suggest, uh, make a link between those two uh, denarii that you saw in verse 35. You remember the man that was uh, half dead and that was then taken care of by the Samaritan was brought to the inn, and there he was left to the care of the innkeeper, and the innkeeper received two denarii. So we can wonder what is it. Some think this is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Others suggest that this would uh, imply the Holy Spirit and prayer. So perhaps we may suggest that this implies the provisions the Lord has given through his word, as we see at the end of chapter 10. And then he says, Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken from her. She is there in the house, in a setting of rest, where the Lord is teaching. So this is a wonderful um, provision that the Lord has made also for us today, to be at his feet, to enjoy his fellowship, to learn from him. And then in chapter 11, we see also another provision, prayer, and in connection with the Holy Spirit. And we'll see in verse 13, uh, here it's not a matter of the Holy, person, the Holy Spirit in person, but about his activity, that he would have free course to act among us and in our lives. And so those provisions the Lord has given while he is on a journey. We'll see later he will be going to a far or to a distant country. But in the meantime he has left these provisions for us, for our benefit. So the word and then prayer. Prayer also connected to the Holy Spirit, as we see now in this uh, paragraph that is before us. It's good to remind ourselves that in many ways the Lord Jesus is also presented as the great model. As we see here, Martha being instructed, and she needed a little correction, Mary being instructed at the feet of the Lord Jesus. We see in this book also how the Lord Jesus himself is a true instructed one. We saw that already in Luke 2, um, how he was instructed by God, by the Father, according to Isaiah 50. And so the Lord Jesus is in many ways an example, a model for us in this book. This is just one example. And so to be at the Lord's feet is to be at the feet of the one who learned himself. He was the great disciple, and now he is the great teacher to teach you and me as well. Now notice in, when we go to chapter 11, we see it's connected with a certain place. So here we have the provisions that the Lord will give, but it is underlined by the Holy Spirit here, in a certain place. So this may connect this provision of the house of God with um, a locality. It's just a suggestion, but when we understand Paul's ministry, as it is developed later on in the New Testament, we see that God thought this to have a house of God in different localities. Of course, we know there's only one universal house of God, and we belong to that, and we have a place in that. Ephesians 2 explains that. But this universal house of God is then seen in localities, as we find in the New Testament. Corinthians calls it that they were house of God, or body of Christ. And so they were the expression of the house of God. And that is what we are today. We are in the house of God to be taught and to benefit of the, of the activity of the Holy Spirit, as we see in this portion. But at the same time, we also represent the house of God. We are the house of God. And so we connect, we may connect this with this certain place, the locality where we are. And so the Lord is here a model again. As I said earlier, he is the perfect disciple, taught in God's school, and now he is the great teacher. He is also a model in connection with praying. He is praying here. And after he had finished, one of the disciples asked this question, Lord, teach us to pray. So we see here again the Lord as model, now in connection with prayer. And this disciple asks this question uh, and links it with John the Baptist. John was the greatest of the prophets, the greatest born among women, as the Lord says. And so this great prophet, the rabbi, uh, taught his own disciples. And so this disciple thought, well, the Lord Jesus is now a rabbi, and we were following him, so he needs to do the same thing. But we, we understand that the, the idea by Luke put these things together is divine design, that the Word goes together with prayer and the Holy Spirit. They always need to go together. 
Someone has said, if you have only the word, you get formalism. If you have only the spirit, it leads to fanaticism. You need both. And this is expressed in these two denarii. It's expressed in the way that these two different sections are here put together. In verse 2, we see then how the Lord Jesus answers this uh, question. The first we understand the disciple, by asking this question, realizes this is a priority. The matter of prayer is a priority. It needs to have priority in our life also. And then, of course, the word of God has to have priority, as we have seen this Mary the last time. And then we see how the Lord Jesus answers this uh, question, and he says, when ye pray. Now, remember, I said earlier, the Lord Jesus is the great model in this book. We find him seven times in prayer. If you include the cross, where we have the prayer, Father, forgive uh, them, we have eight times the Lord in prayer. If you include the three prayers in Gethsemane, instead of counting them one, counting them as three prayers, you get to ten prayers. Anyway, this is just uh, to say that the Lord Jesus is a man of prayer in this gospel. He is the dependent man. This gospel describes the Lord Jesus emphasizing his humanity. Of course, we find many references to his deity. We, this person is beyond our grasp. It's a mystery, the mystery of piety, 1 Timothy 3.16. But the emphasis in this book is on his humanity. And so here we find a dependent man in prayer. And so he wants the disciples to be dependent on God in prayer. We find this then in the book of Acts. It's very striking. The same author is used by the Holy Spirit to write the book of Acts. And what do we, what do we see there? Then we see a company of disciples always in prayer. In Luke, the Lord Jesus in prayer, the man of prayer. In the book of Acts, a company of believers in prayer at many different occasions. And that is therefore a double lesson for us. The Lord personally is our model, and then the early Christians in the book of Acts are examples for us as well, also collectively. Notice who he addresses in this prayer. Father, this is new. Of course, the depth of the relationship now between us and the Father, as was revealed in John's Gospel, John 20, verse 17, where the Lord says to Mary, Go and tell my brethren, I ascend to your God and my God, to your Father and my Father. That was something that was not uh, revealed to, to this fullness as it, as, as, um, as, at this moment it was not revealed to that fullness. That's my point. Although this is already new that they would address God as Father. So this is a wonderful relationship that the Lord Jesus indicates here. It's a wonderful focus to focus on God as Father, to know that He cares, to know that He is in control, to know that He loves us, to know that He leads us, and also to see his position. In the King James, it is uh, added, probably from uh, Matthew 6, about, um, our Father who art in heaven. So, here it is simply Father, so the in intimacy of the relationship, and, of course, he is in heaven. We are a heavenly people connected with the Father in heaven. But then, the second point is thy name. So, the disciples should be very much concerned about God's interests, God's personal interests, by name be hallowed, so that his character would be seen. The name shows who a person is, that is a principle in scripture. And so thy name be hallowed, uh, sanctified, would mean then that his name would be honored and made great. Of course, this is, first of all, to be done in the personal lives of the disciples. Uh, perhaps this is also an emphasis on the collective side of prayer. It's not only an individual prayer, as we found earlier in this book, I think in Luke 6, it is now also, when we are together, that we would address the Father this way and that we would be occupied with His interest. Thy name be hallowed. So it presupposes this relationship, it presupposes um, that we are uh, interested in God's rights, that we have uh, understanding of his greatness and his character. And so there are many New Testament teachings that work this matter of sanctification uh, further out. So I leave that for your study. But this, the, the practical working out of this part of the prayer is, has, is very great. 
and you find this developed in many parts of the New Testament, how God can be honored and how we can grow in this sanctification and honor God and a response to his uh, holiness and greatness. There's also a thought of the sovereignty of God. He is sovereign and this is implied even in this prayer by kingdom come. We pray for it but we know he is going to introduce it. He is going to bring it about. Now again, this would also be a topic, a very vast topic to study, just like the matter of sanctification, the matter of God's name and person, also the matter of the kingdom is a very big topic. Uh, when the Lord Jesus was there, we'll see later in this book, where the king is, is the kingdom. So the kingdom was right there among them, that he says in Luke 17, for example. But here it is seen as coming, and you can look at that from two uh, perspectives. In public glory, then it's still to come, but when you look at it as it's developed here in Luke's gospel, the kingdom of God, then it has come. We are in the kingdom of God. We are disciples in the kingdom of God. We are under the leadership of the Lord Jesus in the kingdom of God. In that sense, it has come. And then the, the request would be that God's rights would be honored in his kingdom. By kingdom come, that it would be really manifested. But as I said, the prophetic working out of this is still future. But in a moral way, we see this greatness displayed now in the Lord Jesus at God's right hand. We see uh, Romans 14, 17, that we are in the kingdom of God, not eating and drinking, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Uh, and we see in Colossians 1 that we have the best part in the kingdom of the Son of the love of the Father. So this topic of the kingdom is very great. You find, I think the word kingdom 46 times, or I may be mixed up with Matthew, but um, if I count it uh, right, the kingdom of uh, of God, which is very, very prominent in Luke's gospel, is found, I have, I have jotted it down somewhere, I, if I find it back I'll tell you, but it's very interesting to see how many times uh, it is mentioned, the kingdom of God. It's a very prominent theme in this book, and so that goes also parallel with the teaching we find further developed in Paul's writings, not so much the kingdom of God in its future uh, public display, but the kingdom of God in its moral character and its moral power today. And again, that goes together with the activity of the Holy Spirit, as we'll see at the end of this paragraph. So first, this prayer would focus on the Father, his name, his, his kingdom. Notice it is his kingdom, so it's not only the kingdom of God, it is here the kingdom of the Father. So that is very intimate. But then the focus shifts on the disciples, in verse 3, give us our needed bread for each day. So we can apply it to our physical needs. We may ask for those needs to be met. Do you realize that? We are living up in, in a society of affluence. But God wants us to express our uh, dependence upon him for every day that our needs would be fulfilled. The, the, the bread would really imply all the needs we have physically to be fed, to be sustained, like the people in the wilderness, the manna they received daily. And it is also good to uh, see that this is for each day, which implies then dependence. The Lord does not say, you pray for a year's supply, so then you would not longer be dependent. You pray for one day's supply. Just like this, there were many people in those days who would work, and at the end of the day they would get their salary and then they could, could uh, buy their food. So they were always dependent day by day upon God. And so we need to realize that we are dependent day by day upon God. It is good to be dependent. In Psalm 119, to give an example, you find in verse 105 this prayer uh, or this, uh, uh, this uh, comparison, an analogy, that thy word is a land unto my feet. So, step by step, you need the light of the word. The Lord does not give light for ten steps, he gives light for one step at a time. It's the same principle. He gives food for one day at a time. And so it is also with his spiritual food. Apply it now to the spiritual food. The Lord 
has a rich supply in the Word and in His Spirit, but He gives on a daily basis. Otherwise, we would become independent. That's really the point, I think. And the Lord wants us to be dependent upon Him so that we would receive these things really in communion with Him and that we would enjoy these things in communion with Him. And then there is this point, remit us our sins, for we also remit to everyone indebted to us. That's a very difficult uh, point to understand. But I suggest here it's not the penalty for sin. Who can uh, settle that? Only the Lord could do that. And he paid the penalty for our sin. It's here now a matter of attitude that we would show a forgiving spirit, just like uh, God shows a forgiving spirit towards us. He wants us to show a forgiving spirit to others as well. I remember a story of a brother who was uh, sick, and there was another brother with whom he had had a quarrel, and this other brother wants to come and make it right before this other brother who was sick would die. He refused to see him. That is an unforgiving spirit, and that is terrible. That is the total opposite of what we find here in verse 4. So we met as our sins here has to do with administration, with the application of what we have received. Not that we can settle the penalty of sin, but we should show a forgiving spirit. That is what God has in mind. And he wants his children to reflect the same attitude. In Matthew 18, you find a whole uh, parable about this. Where the Lord speaks about this man who was indebted. Tremendous debt, 10,000 talents. And then the king gives him um, remission. And then he goes out and he meets his fellow servant who only owed him 100 pennies. And so that's no comparison. And then he puts this man in prison because of those 100 pennies. He did not, he received so great forgiveness from God, he did, he did, not, he did not show the spirit of forgiveness towards his fellow. And that is exactly the point here that we should show an attitude of forgiveness. I know a sister, she refuses categorically to forgive her husband because he had, he had sinned. That was wrong. He committed, he, he confessed it. But to categorically refuse forgiveness, to give forgiveness, that's wrong. That's not the attitude that we find here. And so you can find many practical applications that show how important this principle is. And then at the end of verse 4, we find another request, lead us not into temptation. Why is this needed? It shows that we are aware of our weakness, that we realize how weak we are in ourselves. And so in order to be protected, we ask this prayer, lead us not into temptation. We are weak, and we are easily, we are easily prey for the enemy. Of course, this is not all that the Bible says about temptation. Like, if we face temptation, we have to flee. Just like Joseph, he fled. Otherwise, he would have fallen into sin. It is, neither it is when the enemy comes as an enemy to attack, like the roaring lion, then it says we should resist. So there are situations that we need to resist, and then we need to have the Lord, uh, to have the Lord help. There are also situations that we need to flee so that we will not fall. And so the prayer is here, realizing our own weakness, express it this way, lead us not into temptation. To give one more example, think of Paul, and Paul was drawn up into the third heaven. We see that the Lord sent a loud, yeah, sent an angel of Satan, so that Paul would not get proud. Even the Apostle Paul was able to become proud. And this goes together with this prayer. Lead us not into temptation. The Lord uh, answered that prayer in this way that he sent an, an angel of Satan to, and you can see that in 2 Corinthians 12, and Paul prayed that this would be removed from him three times, but the Lord did not do that, because the Lord allowed this so that Paul would not fall into temptation. It was really to protect him. It was really to preserve him, to help him, so that he would not become proud. And so the Lord answers this prayer in these ways. Then the Lord, oh yeah, let me say this also, if you compare this with Matthew, there are many differences, there are also many parallels, but there you find a few more elements, and also uh, at the end uh, a benediction. 
that you do not find here. Perhaps this is also led by the Holy Spirit this way to show, first of all, these were different occasions that the Lord uh, teaches. Matthew 6 and Luke 11 is not the same occasion, a different place and so a different teaching. It also brings out this principle that the Lord didn't want this prayer to be a just a form. I once visited a family and they asked to ask me to give thanks for the food and then there was one man present there and he was very surprised that why didn't he pray the Lord's prayer? He was he thought that at every occasion we should pray the Lord's prayer and it became a form uh, with an official status. That was needed if that's not there then it's no good. But this is not at all the intention of the Lord. He wants us to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, and so he provides us this element that should be present in our prayers. And But if we make a form from this and say, well, this element has to be there all the time, and we have to pray this way, otherwise it's no good, then we go beyond the intention that the Lord has here. It's really the matter of the spirit of the prayer that we need to grasp. Just like Paul explains later in Second Corinthians 3, what matters is the spirit of this prayer, not the letter. And so the Lord brings them this parable in verse 5. Uh, there are two parables. The first parable is this, of this friend. Who among you shall have a friend? And, and I have nothing to set before him. And then in verse 7, he within answering should say, Do not disturb me, the door is already shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise up to give it thee. I say to you, although he will not get up and give them to him because he is his friend, because of his shamelessness, at any rate, he will rise and give him as many as he wants. Uh, of course, in the Middle East, it was and it's still custom to be very uh, hospitable. If that's not the case, it's a grave social sin. Now, the point here of this parable is to show that God is a giver. So, we should pray, as he says then in verse 9, I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Don't be afraid that you have to go to to the end with God. You have to insist so much and then finally perhaps he will listen to you. No. God is a great giver. So this is a this parable is really a contrast to help us understand how God is a great giver. He would not act like this friend and finally we give. No, God is a great giver. He is pleased to give. And that is then the point in verse 9 where you have the application. I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. You don't have to pray uh, 37 times first and then God finally will perhaps open one ear. That's not the point. The point is that God always listens and he is ready to give, ask and it shall be given to you. Again, we have here this dependence, and it, it, it does imply the thought of keep on asking, but not with the thought of this parable that you have to be in, um, in, in a dead-end situation before God will perhaps uh, listen to you. There is also an increase in intensity in verse 9. First, ask, so you realize your dependence, then seek and you shall find. Seek is a a, a more, how should I say, a deeper exercise. If you study all the uh, scriptures in the New Testament that uh, speak about seek, you'll see it goes together with spiritual exercise. And this exercise is therefore already deeper than with simply asking. But when you come to the third, it's even more intense. The Lord himself knocks. You know, the, the door of Lady Sia, the Lord knocks. It's very urgent. It's after other uh, things that he had already spoken to them that he then knocked at the door. So this uh, is a lesson for us to uh, persevere, to insist, and to be blunt in, in this way. And then he says, it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that not, it will be opened. That is the promise we have, because God is a giving God doesn't mean, mean that he will answer exactly the prayer as you pray it. The Lord knows what is good for us, but he will answer. 
Even if he say no, it is an answer. Or if he says wait, it is an answer. So we need to ask and seek and knock. And we need to go uh, to do that ongoing. Then there's another parable which shows another lesson in verse 11, but of whom of you that is a father shall a son ask bread, and the father shall give him a stone. Here we have the matter of counterfeit. God is a great giver, and what he gives are good gifts. If today many people pray to God and to Satan, to the idols, they would give counterfeit. Satan is very clever. He can change to an angel of light, and so he may answer a prayer to a certain person who addresses him and brings uh, and bring something that is very similar to what the person asked for. It's a counterfeit. Instead of bread, it's a stone. It doesn't fit. That is what you find in uh, orthodoxy. It's an outward form. It cannot be. The second uh, comparison is a fish or a serpent. Fish is something living. The serpent is also something living. What's the difference? The serpent is poisonous. The fish would provide uh, sustenance. So that is again a counterfeit with a terrible uh, effect. And in the third case, even worse, instead of an egg, which is so healthy, which contains so uh, much nutrition, a scorpion, which would have deadly effect or would attack the person instead of feed. So this is three counterfeits. Now, when God gives, he gives good gifts. But the Lord will point out something in verse 13. If therefore ye being evil, so even an earthly father would not do that, he would not give counterfeit. For Satan does that. But even an earthly father, being evil, that shows man's depravity, that shows that the wicked generation in the time of the Lord could still give good gifts to their own children. But they didn't realize that themselves, they were in great danger, as you will see in the next paragraph. They were in danger to be satisfied with a stone, with a serpent, and with a scorpion. They were exposing themselves to the influence of Satan, the alphabet, although they accused the Lord of being an instrument of Satan. You will see that in a moment. This is what they would choose between the Lord and these counterfeits. They would take these counterfeits. It's a sad story. But the point here in verse 13 is, of course, the Lord is a giver of good things. If even those people could give good things, or not evil, uh, being evil, would give good things to their children, how much rather shall the Father, who is of heaven, that's an interesting expression, he is not only in heaven, but he is of heaven. The gifts come down from heaven. Like in John 1, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of light. This is the thought of heaven. He is the great giver, and the gift comes down from him. And then we come to this difficult point. Um, shall the Father who is of heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, there are two things I want to point out. The first thing is this. At that time, the Holy Spirit was not dwelling on earth yet in the believer. And so... This prayer we find then in Acts 1. In Acts 1, according to the uh, instructions, you read the whole chapter, then you see that the Lord said they have to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come. And then you see they are praying. But the Holy Spirit came in Acts 2. So did they have to continue to pray for the Holy Spirit to come? No, of course not. And that is the misunderstanding. People today who are believers think they have to pray for the Holy Spirit to come. And they have all kinds of things, they organize meetings for the Holy Spirit to be poured out and to come. It's a misunderstanding. So, those who have not yet received the Holy Spirit, they don't have to ask for it, because the moment they, they believe, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells, dwells in them. Now, still, I think this prayer may have a meaning for us also in this context, because Holy Spirit is without article, without definite article. So that would emphasize then that we would ask for the influence of the Holy Spirit, for the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is a healthy prayer in the sense that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord uh, in Ephesians 5, Paul says, we must be filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And 
Uh, I'll just check it. I'm not sure whether the article is used there. I'll just read it in Ephesians 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And in the original, it is without article. It is really in power or in the power of Spirit. So, the emphasis is again on what the Holy Spirit does, how he would fill us, and he would fill us so that he can be a useful vessel controlled by the Holy Spirit. So even there, if we pray, according to these instructions, we pray that we may be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as a divine person, indwells us. Our bodies are, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Together, when, when we were saved, the love of God was shed abroad into our hearts through the Spirit whom God has given us. So he, he is in us. He dwells in us. But now the point is that we give room to the Holy Spirit so that he can use the Word, as we find in the end of chapter 10, and the Holy Spirit can then use us as instruments in his hands. That is the thought. So that we would be useful vessels. We find that with Stephen in Acts 7, how he was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is how the Lord Jesus wants us to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, so that we are instruments in his hand. So we don't pray for the Holy Spirit to come. He has received the Holy Spirit the moment we believe. But we should pray that we may be, that we may give room to the Holy Spirit, so that he may control us. And that everything that is in contrast with the Holy Spirit may be removed. And that would be a good prayer. And then in verse 14, that's what I said. You know, this, this evil generation would receive Satan's counterfeits because they were rejecting their own Messiah. And that's what we see now in verse 14. The Lord was casting out a demon. But note that this man was a dumb man. It means that he could not speak, but it also means that he could not hear. He was dead. Now, if you compare this with Matthew 9, and there is also another passage in Matthew 12, but we don't have much time to go into the details, but it's very striking. In Matthew, we find the Lord did this twice. Already the first time, in Matthew 9, the leaders said that this must be of the Elzebub. And then when the Lord Jesus did a similar miracle the second time in Matthew 12, then they publicly declared that he did this through the alphabet. And then the Lord Jesus said that this was the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and this could not be forgiven. So this generation of the leaders of those days, those evil shepherds, they had placed themselves under the control of Satan while they were accusing the Lord Jesus of being an instrument of Satan. See how bad the situation was. They said the Lord Jesus had done these miracles, or these miracles, through the Elzebub, the prince of the demons. And later, this became the official accusation. We know this from other writings, not from the scriptures. We know in John, uh, there were two arguments, the religious argument and then the political argument. You can see that at the end of John, they used it. So the religious art, um, accusation implied, although it's not specified in the New Testament, but it implies the accusation that we find here already, that the Lord Jesus was demon possessed. That was their accusation. And on that basis, they rejected him. And on that basis, the destruction came over them in the year 70. Because they had given themselves um, completely to Satan. They got a stone and a serpent and a scorpion. Instead of being controlled by the Holy Spirit, they were controlled by Satan himself. And they accused the Lord Jesus of being controlled by Satan. And now the Lord Jesus is going to show, therefore, how wrong their reasoning was. So even that generation, because in this chapter it is not mentioned that it was this, this, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So the, the way that Luke points it out, you almost get the impression that even those people were still in the day of grace so that they could change their minds. Or at least the people around them uh, could change their mind because of the instruction the Lord gave here. So the Lord is going to answer that point in verse 15 in the next verses. But first he has verse 16. Others tempting him. These were other uh, religious leaders 
who entered him and sought from him a sign out of heaven. He, he didn't gi just given a sign. His healing was so miraculous. Even in their own writings, they admitted that only the Messiah could do this. There were, uh, among the Pharisees, exorcists. And they would uh, contact the demon in that person and then command the demon to go out. Well, first of all, it's just like many people do today. There's no guarantee that the demon didn't come back right away. And in many cases, it does. Secondly, there was another uh, thing uh, at stake here. And this is... Uh, even worse, I just lost the uh, train of my thoughts, so I have said not only that those uh, sons, and we'll come back to that later, did this, that there were, was exorcism, but that exorcism doesn't mean that those demons were then gone completely. If the Lord cast out a demon, this demon could never come back. Secondly, what we find here, this was such a great miracle, and that's the point I want to make, that even those a uh, religious leader had written, we don't find it in the Bible, but it is in the uh, literature, that only the Messiah could do this. They were not able to cast out a demon from a dumb person because you could not speak to a dumb person. Do you understand? It's impossible. So they admitted that they could not do that. Only the Messiah could do that. And now the Messiah came, he did it, Matthew 9. They ascribed it to the, to the altar God. The second time he did it, Matthew 12, even a greater miracle, they still uh, uh, ascribed it to the power of the elder. And so they themselves are now going to be controlled by the elder. They are going to um, betray not only their own Messiah, like uh, Judas did, they are going to deny any relationship with him. They say they have no king than Caesar. So they, and that was under the influence of Satan, and the influence of the alphabet, that they were going to deny any connection with the Lord Jesus. It's interesting that the other name, the Alphabet, means Lord of the Dwelling. The Alphabet was a name that was used, Lord of the Flies, and perhaps that is to show that, um, how the uh, Pharisees despise uh, the demon, but he is also called the Alphabet, which means Lord of the realm. And that shows how Baal, because this comes from the Baal worship and those, from those Canaanite religions, how this influence was maintained even in this day, in these days. You find it in the Philistines, and you find even in those days there were people controlled by these powers. Behind these religious, uh, or this idolatry, there were demonic powers. And that was a tremendous power, that the Lord is in control of these powers. He took over this. We cannot imitate this. We can only, if we would meet a person like that, we cannot cast the demon out, but the Lord can, and he can use our prayers to help a person like that, even in such a desperate situation. But if we claim, we can exercise, and then we fall easily into the hands of the enemy, because the enemy is very clever, and he can easily pull us, and that's what's happening. Uh, large scale. Now, the others sought another sign, although this sign was so clear, as I said earlier already, it is such a clear demonstration of the power of the Lord Jesus. Do you need still another sign? It shows their unbelief. And the Lord's going to answer that question, and you'll see that the next time, from verse 29. So then we'll speak more about this sign. But now, in verse 17, the Lord is going to answer the first accusation that he had cast out by the prince of the demon. And it says very strikingly in verse 17 that he, knowing their thoughts, he was aware of their reasoning and their conclusions. So that shows the greatness of the Lord Jesus. He knew their minds. We've seen that earlier in this book. And first he shows the uh, how illogic this uh, argument is. It doesn't make sense at all. Can you Do you think that Satan would do something against his own interests? would be stupid to uh, think like that. It is totally illogical and ridiculous. So that is the first argument. The second argument is in verse 19, if I would do this through the alphabet, the Lord says, through whom do your sons do it then? And they also would do it, that is the implication, and they also would do it through the alphabet. You cannot deny that your sons do it. 
but through what power do they do it? So that's the second way the Lord uh, condemns the argument. Those how inconsistent the argument was. The third argument is verse 20. I, by the finger of God. So here is a person who acts by the finger of God. Now when you read in Exodus 8, uh, this around verse 13 or so, you have this place that under Moses and Aaron that were first the water was changed into blood and then the um, the magicians that Pharaoh had imitated those things. Or the frogs would come out of the water and they imitated that. And there was another thing with the dust. But now there was a light. There was something, the ashes was changed into light. Living creatures. They could not imitate that. But interestingly, Second Timothy 3, Paul refers to Janus and Jambres as the uh, magicians that Pharaoh had to oppose Moses. The imitation was really a form of opposition. And now these opponents, they had to confess before Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. When life was created from the ashes, they knew this is the finger of God. And so that shows the power that was there. The Lord Jesus, he had tremendous power by casting out this demon from this dumb man. And so this was the finger of God. And now notice the difference. The magicians, they realized it. Here those religious leaders, they did not even realize that, what the Lord was doing. So that shows how bad situation we have here. The parallel passage in Matthew 12, it says, by the Holy Spirit, so by the Spirit of God. So there the Lord Jesus clearly does it through the Spirit of God. So there's no question about it. It's not through a demonic spirit. He does this through the Spirit of God and that is the finger of God. And then we see, he says that the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's very interesting that, now I find my note back, I said earlier, the kingdom of God as an expression is found many times in Luke, 32 times. A few days ago I was studying in Matthew and I counted the number of times that the kingdom of heaven is used. 32 times. It's very striking. In Matthew's gospel, also a few times the, the expression kingdom of God. But this is uh, very characteristic for Luke. So that's a, a wonderful theme. So the Lord Jesus, he represents the kingdom of God. He's a king and he shows his power. The fourth argument is really in the form of a parable in verse 21. When the strong man armed keeps his own house, his goods are in peace. The strong man here is Satan, of course. You have to understand the connection. But when the stronger than he, coming upon him, overcomes him, he takes away his penalty in which he trusted, and he does the right to spoil he has taken from him. That's exactly what the Lord has done. The Lord overcame the power of the enemy when he Help, uh, healed this dumb man and who was blind also according to Matthew and delivered him from this demonic power. You may think also of what we find in Luke 4, the temptation in the wilderness was three times tempted by the devil and then the devil had to leave him. So that was the initial victory that the Lord Jesus had but he was going to show more strength towards the enemy and take all his goods away and that was during the ministry of the Lord Jesus and of course at the cross we see the complete and final victory when he overcame Satan in all these different powers that he had the power of death he overcame him he annulled the one who had the power of death he annulled the power of death but also in Colossians we see how the Lord Jesus was the great triumph savior great overcomer. And in First John 3, verse 8, I'll just read that first, the Lord Jesus came. In First John 3, verse 8, it's a very helpful verse to, in this context, to read. In the middle of verse 8, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And the, the word destroy here is undo. And in other scriptures like Hebrews 2, uh, it is to annul, uh, to take away the, that it would have no effect. So Satan would have no effect in his dealings, in his power, nothing was left. So it's a total victory 
So the moral victory was already in the temptation, and then the Lord Jesus took away these goods, like this man who, who had been demon possessed, he was delivered, and that's an illustration of what we have here in verse 22, when the stronger than he coming upon him overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted, and then he will divide the spoil. But the final fulfillment, of course, is after the work was completed at the cross, after uh, burial and resurrection, and then we see the Lord Jesus went up, and he took captivity captive. So there is the full result of this victory. And then in verse 23, that is the conclusion, he that is not with me is against me. We have seen a similar expression in chapter 9, uh, where it is in connection with service. And there it was said, if someone is not against you, he is, he is for you. This was in connection with service. And so the disciples had to learn there uh, an important lesson. But when it comes, like here in verse 23, to this matter of the person or the work of the Lord, then it is either for or against. There is no other way. There is not just, they are not with you, so they are for you. No, that's not the case. If they are not with me, then they are against me. So this is the matter of the person and the work of the Lord as is seen here in this passage. And he that gathers not with me scatters. So the Lord gives then a six point, and that is the illustration with some other parable in verse 24, to underline what had been happening. I said this generation of evil persons, the leaders, who would not even do that themselves, give a stone for bread to their children, they were not aware that they themselves were under the influence of Satan. They accused the Lord of being an instrument of Satan, but they were themselves under Satan's influence. And that is now described in verse 24 to 26. So the unclean spirit has gone out. That was the spirit of idolatry. When the Lord sent his people into captivity, that was a chastisement. And in Babel, Babel is the origin of idolatry. That is where idolatry started. God brought his people back to Babylon, to the root of idolatry. And there they were chastised. Psalm 137 describes what they felt there and how they learned the lesson. They would condemn idolatry. And so when they came back from the captivity, there was no idolatry in the land. The house was empty. The spirit of idolatry was gone. And this idolatry was a very bad form of idolatry. If you read Ezekiel 8, just give one example, you see how terrible this idolatry was, even in the temple of God. And so the Lord had to do something. But after the captivity, that spirit was gone. But they were in great danger. This is like a like orthodoxy. They had Ezra, Ezra was a believer, but then the generations after Ezra, they built a wall of protection around the, the law. They said, this will never happen again. This will never happen again. The house was empty, and then you are in a very dangerous situation. The house was also adorned. All the teachings of those Pharisees and those religious leaders was like adorning the house. But it was not with God's provision. It was adorned with their own provision. And the Lord shows in his ministry, ministry how wrong these traditions were. We have seen some, some examples of that already. Now you can apply this to, Christ, to the history of the church. In some cases, like the Reformation, spirit of idolatry was gone. But an empty house is a dangerous situation. It's no guarantee that things will be in order. The house needs to have the right occupant, needs to be under the right leadership. It needs to be under the control of the Lord. We talked about the house, the house of prayer, the house to sit at the feet of the Lord. That is God's concept of the house. The Lord is central. But in this house, although the idolatry is gone, the Lord has no place. They did not receive him. Instead, when the Lord did these miracles, they started to investigate. At another occasion, I've mentioned this, this process. And then, gradually, they excluded him. They didn't have anything to do with him. So the house was still empty, although it was set and adorned. And then what happens then? Because they rejected the Lord Jesus, the Spirit had an opportunity to come back with seven other spirits worse than he was himself, verse 26. And that was going to happen with, first of all, they placed themselves under the influence of Beelzebub by 